Shall we begin? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, I, I extend a very good morning to everybody. And yes, it's a Sunday morning. Um, but we are very happy here to be with all of you. It's an online media and I cannot see all of you. But the, that's how we, are, we just have to get used to working online. And uh, knowing that, yes, across the screen where I cannot see, there are 77 participants as I'm able to see my screen shows me. So we're going to talk today on vocal, uh, vocal for local. Now that this is something that's really coming on after the COVID-19, we all know how we have to stand for the local. So we're going to orient ourselves in uh, upon this vocal for local and uh, tell you how we started aligning to this years ago when the practice started. And today when we are speaking about this, we are, we are uh, kind of relieved and we're very happy that yeah, it, this thought process started off years ago. Um, let me just give you a quick background that uh, me and Habib studied in the, the Vishweshwarya uh, Regional College of Engineering and then we went off to the US for our post graduation. We went separately, of course, he went first, I went later. But yeah. when you are young students and you are exposed to the Western culture and uh, you know you read in your history of architecture all about modern architects and contemporary architects, then uh, you have stars in the eyes and yeah, you also want to work like them. So when we finished our masters and we came back to India and set up this Mata and Habib Khan partnership, uh, whatever little, small little projects that we got, we wanted them to be, to stand out. You know, we wanted them to be out of those glossy books. We wanted them to be the way we had seen the projects unfold in the US. And uh, even in Nagpur at that time, the larger projects that were happening uh, were all along those, uh, fashionable lines, I must say, or lines of, uh, in those days, it was postmodernism and deconstruction, which was hitting the headlines, you know. So we would see projects happening in Nagpur also. So you see, our first early small project started off by becoming deconstruction in nature. Because when you deconstruct a project, it stands out. So, you know, when you're young architects, what, do you, what else do you want? You want a project to stand out. It is then when we were seeing this big project, because when you see someone else's project, then you are able to critique better than when we saw a little project and the success that it was uh, getting in those days. So when we saw these big projects, which are also postmodern or deconstruction in nature, we started understanding, yes, sir, something's going wrong somewhere. Because when we look at our society or our community, and then we understand how traditional we are in the way we live, uh, the way we dress, the way we carry out our day-to-day -day activities. And then you look at our buildings and the kind of buildings we as architects are making for our clients who are very traditional because they are not educated in architecture per se the way we are. We are exposed to architecture across the world. We are exposed to international style and deconstruction and postmodernism. These are only names that make no sense to the society. But they're looking out for a fresh expression of architecture. And when an architect gives them something called postmodern, well, they lap it up, but at the end, as young architects, we started thinking that there is something wrong and we need to start thinking. And here is where the thought process started. Now, I'm going to start with telling you what the thought process was. And then since we are talking and preaching about this thought process, uh, we would like to continue on and show you the, our endeavor, a little effort that we have put in, uh, in, in actual building. So our practice kind of aligns with what we are talking about or what we thought in those days as young architects and continue to believe today in practice. Uh, one second, I'm not able to go ahead. Here, I would like to start it by uh, simply saying that yes, man has always shared a symbiotic relationship with nature. And this kind of a relationship that we have with nature results in a contextual framework. This contextual framework, uh, it, it connects to the land, to our land, the land to which we belong to. And so here you see it in the pictures, how we are responding, how uh, this is basically the milieu. This is basically our culture. This is where we come from. So if that is true, then it should be true of architecture also. So here is some, there was a time when this kind of uh, thing was wisdom to everybody. And the way people were, so also they made their architecture. So the architecture is also rooted to the, to the land. Like people are rooted to the land, the architecture is also rooted to the land. And so architecture was, and architecture should essentially be contextual. You see here how the buildings are uh, 
responding to the topography, how they're taking from the local materials. You see the warm hue of the bricks that is coming up into the buildings. And hey, look at this. That's what the earth is made of. And you see how when it, it got molded into something which is a man-made creation, which is architecture, which is a shelter for human beings. You see how that which is so rugged and that which is natural has been tamed. And uh, while it is still subservient to nature and yet it is there for the human beings. So uh, here is something that uh, Habib basically uh, loves to say whenever he is out on uh, addressing uh, young architects and the architecture fraternity he says, Jane kaha gaye wo din? where did all those days go when we were constructing like this? Um, so this is, this is how, I, these are examples of vernacular architecture, which in which they essentially made of earth, which is just under our feet and available to all of us. And just notice the climate responsiveness, the land responsiveness and the traditional responsiveness of this architecture. And this is right across the globe. You go just anywhere and vernacular is something that is so very contextual. And you can't even differentiate where the nature stops and where the man-made shelter begins. And these are some of the spectacular uh, vernacular architectures that we have. So architecture is not only rooted to the ground upon which it sits, but it is also an extension of all of us, people, culture, our milieu. Now, whenever we make an architectural creation, see every architectural creation is, is always a step in the onward evolution of the land to which it belongs. So when we started with the humble dwellings, we come to the more public architecture, the civic architecture. And there we find that it had a, a, There's a, there's a, I can't hear. Can, can you all hear? No. No. There's, can you hear me? No, sir. No, sir. If the line problem may be resolved, maybe it should become okay. <clears throat> can you see my screen? Can you hear me? No, ma'am. No? no? Yeah, we can hear you, but the screen is not open. The screen is not yeah, open. No, I can hear you. Can you but hear us? Screen? Yes, we can hear you. And yeah. up at the screen. The screen is not open. Just yeah? screen share it again. Share the screen again. Okay. okay. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, this disconnectivity is one of the things to just take in our stride. Okay, here, here is where we are talking about some of the very important civic buildings that we have in India. So see how long architecture uh, goes back into history. With over 3000 years of recorded history, our Indian vernacular traditions grew and evolved from a very strong and cohesive architecture. And while this was an evolution going on in land, we had people coming into our land because this land was such a land of promise that when these people came in, our evolution grew richer with the assimilations and inputs from the various cultures that came into our land, coming in, including the British. I mean, this is an example of how the Mughal architecture, the architecture that was brought from outside the boundaries of India into India assimilated and made something which is called Indo-Sarsanic architecture. This is the architecture of Humayun's tomb. And here, of course, the British and the Gateway of India. And you see how Indian it is, in spite of taking in uh, its symmetry, its geometry, its form, 
which is all very European, but it's still very Indian. So it's all assimilating. The vernacular process of growth and evolution continued in spite of changed and newer functional needs and expressions. Even we needed a government building or we needed a victory gate, it kept changing. And in spite of geographical, climatic, and cultural diversities, it still fell into a cohesive expression. Here we are seeing how it is mingling into what was an evolution happening in our own land into the various cultures that came in. And these are various different regions. This is from Goa, and we are uh, now uh, uh, we are now syncing it with the Portuguese architecture that was brought in. And here is when uh, industrial revolution and its effects came into India when the British were ruling India, and this evolution was interrupted because of it. And I would still say the buildings are very sane. I'm just going to go on now to talking about something very different. So this is the result of globalization that started off with uh, the coming in of art deco. And these are some buildings in Mumbai. And after the industrial revolution came in something called modern architecture. And here we have Le Corbusier in his full glory. And this is the capital uh, complex of Chandigarh. Modern Indian architecture of today intentionally defies older neighbors rather than standing beside them in peace. Now that's where the conflict started. But there was no conflict really as long as cultures were coming in, assimilating, and we were still having an architecture that belonged to us. We were able to identify with it. What modern architecture did was something like, as you're seeing over here, it was extremely chaotic and simply wanted to defy. Whenever industrialization and development penetrated, impersonal forms intruded upon traditional profiles of cities, towns, and villages. This is an example in Nakur where the Sabha Mandap of that temple was taken off and instead of reconstructing it in a style that would be sympathetic to the standing shikhar, you see what they are doing. The predictability and monotony of today's modern architecture is astonishing and it is anguishing. You don't even know from where these buildings are, which of this building is made in Mumbai, which of them is in China and which of them is in uh, somewhere in the Western world, one doesn't know. Now here is something that we are building in Nagpur. We find that we, this is somewhere very close to our home. What kind of buildings are we making today? This is a Tukaram Sabagro in which marriages take place. You know how our weddings are? We are so traditional still. And then, uh, you know, we have this Tukaram Sabagro. So we do call it Tukaram Sabagro, but look at its architecture. There's, there's no sink in between. Semantics is really gone for a toss. Uh, I'm showing you some more buildings in Nagpur. We have a love for pastiche Western. And we're really amused because I'll tell you this building belongs to the Nagpur Improvement Trust. They are uh, a body which is responsible for developing the city of Nagpur. And yeah, this is their, their building. And yeah, this is a detail of the dome. They, it started off with great intentions. Everybody loves Renaissance architecture. Even we would love it if we were walking on the street somewhere in Italy and we say, why this architecture is so fantastic? Why can't we have it? I want a piece of this for my city. And, but when you get a piece of it for your city and you build it like this, then we really have to think, where are we going? So yes, we are uh, happy in what we are doing. Huh? This is pastiche, neither here nor there. And then we come to this kind of thing. What kind of buildings are these? Do we all think when we are looking at this evolution that something has really gone amiss with our contemporary architecture? That as Indians with 3000 years of recorded history, we have to perform better, that we owe a responsibility. See the chain of evolution is totally broken when you look at this kind of architecture happening under the skies, temperatures which you know, touch 45 degrees, and these are glass blocks, and we are inside. So all vernacular architecture yes. was contained. <clears throat> I'm going to now talk of vernacular architecture. Would you like to say something? I think I, sh I would. Uh... Yeah, I mean, what we are doing these days is the, the, the previous slide that we saw. We are not only making glass boxes, which are unsuitable to our uh, climate, context, culture. And we are, we are protruding them out so that all the sun comes in. And this is, this is baseless and senseless copying of the Western architectural model, model wherein they want to bring the sun in and we want to keep the sun out 
and that is the fundamental difference that is happening between the between the non contextual architecture that is happening these days so uh, we are creating problems and then trying to give solutions to those problems but vernacular architecture uh, you know was ingrained uh, can we go to the next slide vernacular architecture was always you know uh, was uh, 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 ingrained in freedom there was a sense of freedom like we all saw we all saw the slides wherein wherein there was a, a framework within which the vernacular architecture was uh, was uh, uh, fitting in and this freedom always came with responsibility and that responsibility was that it was fitting into the contextual the climatic and the cultural framework and traditionally creativity was always linked with common sense to be to uh, today we have lost uh, the sense of common sense we are creating problems and uh, uh, and trying to give solutions to it can we go quicker faster all vernacular architecture relied on logic and purpose like i said there was logic and purpose indian vernacular architecture respected growth in conjunction with continuity there was a continuity that smita was talking of there was a chain of evolution that happened and that was the continuity that we 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 were talking of and it exhibited creative and aesthetical details which are often solutions to a problem i just talked about it that the problem was being problem is being created these days and then we're trying to give solutions to those problems we are creating those problems knowingly and uh, the traditional architecture the vernacular architecture actually uh, was a solution to a problem rather than creation of a problem and this is the fundamental difference that we all need to understand to understand the thought process and architecture at smita and abhiv khan architects is a response to this and the realization of the importance and the appropriateness of the traditions of architecture that have gone by <clears throat> and we architects we as architects you as young students of architecture need to pick up the threads that modernity has severed the need to reinvent a new and more responsive architecture which will be a continuum of this vernacular and will be a response to climate context tradition and culture and of course our lost construction techniques importance of daylight ramifications of heat and appropriateness of built form which will result into a new architectural vocabulary a language which will have its roots in layers of traditional wisdom and not reinventing the wheel and it will also be a fresh interpretation of modern construction techniques and all vernacular principles building forms architectural forms and is also a link between the past and the present the chain of evolution should continue in years to come and this fundamentally we call contemporary vernacular and that is the essence of contemporary vernacular architecture where wherein you are saying if for example if my if the buildings that we are doing is excavated 1000 years down the line it should be evidently clear that it is built in 2020 and not you know 1120 or some ad or some bc but it should be fitting into the time frame so it is very important for us to understand that the time frame of of any architecture is very very important the scale is very very important the time scale is very very important and so learn from the wisdom of the past do not reinvent the wheel and then utilize your uh, senses and your uh, architectural learning to derive something for example this picture if you will see uh, in, in traditional vernacular architecture the wooden post the wooden wooden post used to go down into the mud walls and into the ground and over a period of time it used to decay because of termites and because of the moisture that it used to absorb from the from the wall so what our traditional uh, builders did was to separate the wall a little and have the post standing independently same thing happens when you make a steel pillar or a steel post steel column same thing happens so this the steel starts getting rusted when it is inside encased inside a concrete or a or a brick wall so we have learned and understood why this was done and this is a modern interpretation of uh, of that this is our prideshni institute of architectural and design studies uh, yeah so this this is this, this in nutshell is contemporary vernacular um i'll take it a little further um, just uh, discussing a little more on what contemporary vernacular means this is the prideshni institute where habib happens to be the director now uh, we want to go back to the roots this is what contemporary vernacular stands for going back to roots building sensibly building optimally building intelligently building correctly all of this where we are concerned with 
context, climate, tradition, geology, geography, and economy. So all of these together and also connecting back to our roots. Now this was, so, see, I mean, this was the, I'll, I'll just interfere in it. This was the thought process. This was the philosophy of the entire body of work that we have done over the last 30 years. But the students keep asking time and again as to, you know, uh, it, it is all right to have a thought process, to have a concept or a philosophy, but how do you convert that philosophy or that thought process into actual uh, buildings or actual architectural design? Mm -hmm. So this is the method that Sabhismita is going to say. This is the method of how you can, you know, convert the thought process into actual build form or into actual architectural design. So we have arrived at 10 uh, points. We call it the 10 commandments. And if you are able to uh, use all of them in your architectural designs, you will be able to build contextually and sensibly. Okay, um, so we just read the 10 commandments, which uh, took some time to get formed, but at the end when they are formed, they are uh, crisply put down in 10 points. We'll start one, respect for the local people and their economy. Respect for local climate, culture, and context. Respect for man and nature. Non, use of non-industrial building methods. Five is reinventing and reintroducing introduction of traditional building construction techniques. It is not possible always. It is not possible always to have, you know, do, do use all of them together in a project or something. I mean, non-industrial building methods. So, I mean, I'm not saying you cannot use industrial building methods in your project, but use it sensibly, use it optimally and use it logically. And that is what it means by non-industrial building methods and so on. So, so every point has to be, you know, uh, uh, read and understood in its context and its feasibility. Right. So I, I continue on with point six is continuum of tradition, imaginative use of traditional building techniques, space and volume. So you can always learn from building uh, uh, traditional building techniques. One need not copy them, but like you just said that you have, you have to think it through. How is it supposed to be relevant to us today? And then recycle and reuse, extremely important because so much of building is now being brought down so that new buildings can come up that there is a lot of opportunity to recycle and reuse. Let's do it wherever we can and in whichever best way we can. Then we come to innovation and finishes. When you're talking of recycle and reuse, then you have to think in terms of innovating of the finishes, finishes of the old materials as well as the new materials that will now come in sync with them. And 10th point is use of natural materials and, and an ecological approach towards using them. And if you try so to, if you, if, you, uh, if, you imbibe, if you imbibe all these uh, 10 commandments, uh, we are not giving you commandments like Prophet Moses did. Uh, we are only mm -hmm. saying that this is the, these are the commandments that we give, give to ourselves. And uh, uh, if, if we follow these broader guidelines uh, within the 10 commandments, you will not go wrong as far as, you know, you're able to build a greener building, uh, environmentally sensitive and sustainable buildings. So th these are guidelines that we, uh, and we thought that it would be very useful for the students to understand and, you know, uh, and uh, build within the framework of those 10 commandments. Now, these are project, uh, which is an engineering college campus that we've done. Uh, the clients approached us. I'll just explain this project and then we can run through uh, quickly because we may run out of time. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a project which has been uh, very close to all our hearts and it's a large campus of more than five lakh square feet. The clients approached us and said that, uh, uh, you know, we wanted a different looking building. So we were wondering what's a different looking building. They didn't want an engineering college like an engineering college. So uh, then we said, okay, fine. Uh, uh, we started working on it. So this is mm -hmm. a, the academic block that you are seeing and it is punctured with a lot of courtyards inside which takes diffuse light. Which, they, which, which creates a, a buffer inside. And, uh, you know, the, it is based on the principle that it, it's like a it's like a old town organically growing. The campus is like an old town which will grow organically. So if you see this facade, this development, one, two, three, four, five types of development that you will see, just like uh, uh, it is like, if you, if you recall, we said, uh, you know, uh, can just stop for a while. So uh, okay. we said that there's a, there's a, there's a, a rigid framework, you know, a flexibility, which is given in a framework where you know everyone, uh, one, two, three, four owners have developed their houses in a street. 
but yet it falls into a framework and that's the freedom that traditional architecture gives it to you uh, so in this you next in this you see uh, that uh, uh, the lower floors are uh, uh, load bearing which are which is heavy stone work next please and then then the the building starts getting little lighter you see this this is the stone uh, work on the ground floor then the building starts getting lighter and lighter as it goes up and rises up which is a very logical uh, decision and uh, principle that the uh, our traditional builders used so in this you see all uh, buildings all all materials that you see the, the sandstone on the ground floor the metal structure then the brickwork and then no brickwork at all with all the windows coming up which is a very light uh, top floor top story uh, structure the building sits the this is a admin block which sits on a on a on a sits in a water body to reduce the dryness of the heat and the climate which changes the microclimate of the building if you will notice all the recycled materials the granite columns all windows doors furniture everything that has been used in the building is recycled and reused and refurbished there are various corridors exposed brickwork there is no rcc slab in the entire uh, 5 lakh plus construction because we feel that the concrete is the biggest culprit that happens in our country which absorbs heat uh, and then keeps radiating it back after 8 hours after the sun has gone down so if the sun goes down at 6 o'clock in the evening or 7 o'clock in the evening in summers you will feel uncomfortable in a concrete house till at least 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock when the nature takes over and starts purifying and you know starts cooling down the whole thing this is a western facing facade so what we've done is created a lot of baffle walls long projections to cut down the heat the heat is about 50 degrees in summers here so uh, you know that kind of uh, and this this project got us the interbau award uh, uh, it's an interbau is founded by prince charles and uh, this was the building uh, 2018 awardee for promoting traditional architectural concepts at a large scale in the world and 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 you know the 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 art of stone work stone masonry was totally lost you see this is the first stone masonry that was made by those people when we hunted them brought them on the site they had forgotten their art they had forgotten the dignity that goes with their art and they were either plain masons yeah. or selling vegetables or doing something else so we brought them back they it took some time you know for them to understand and re uh, get in touch with their uh, with their skills so you will see the kind of finishing that is there in the first wall that they made and the next wall that they will make next please yeah we just see the comparison of the new and the old walls now this is the entire walkway is a uh, entire is a cobblestone driveway that reduces the heat if you have a concrete road or a bitumen tar road it, it reflects uh, heat and creates a mini heat island there so the entire driveway is uh, sandstone cobbled sandstone driveway as the load bearing arch arches in this yeah and this is the new wall if you see the old uh, stone masonry and the new stone masonry you will see how they improved their own skills once they came on site and they became confident and you see the later this is the uh, later phase of the building later phase of the, of the campus and it provides and a lot of dignity it provides yes. a lot of dignity to their to their skills when when you are using your skills and getting money out of it earning money out of it then you feel you know inside it rejuvenates the local economy and it restores the dignity of your inherent uh, traditional skills next please you can see you can see the the i mean look at the wisdom of our traditional builders uh, okay, go back please Uh, see that these are the traditional buildings. It's a, it's a eight inches base granite column with six inches tapering. It is taking the load of two floors, uh, uh, two floors. In fact, uh, there's one more floor on top, and about two thousand students sitting there. While an RCC column needs about you know nine inches by twelve inches minimum size because it it buckles. But our granite column, traditionally built, takes the load of the entire uh, you know structure. Next, please. all these are recycled reused refurbished that the entrance porch of the uh, of the building the the main arrival where you arrive, arrive in the lobby traditional uh, iron smiths uh, work from this region where we have used uh, the lobby entrance lobby is contrary to what you can see it's is all open there are no walls except a floor and a roof so because that facilitates lot of cross ventilation and flow of air 
in this heat uh, so you don't need any air conditioning you don't need any air cooling even in uh, in summers various corridors that you will see so the, the slabs that you see are 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 girders are girders and then you have over the girders you have uh, uh, over the girders you have uh, stone and then you have concrete yeah continues So these are various spaces uh, which would you would never think belong to a part of a an engineering college. Uh, these are the corridors, and uh, especially notice the stone masonry. We're very pleased with how the stone uh, masons really, uh, you know, picked up the whole art that they had lost. There's various corridors with exposed brickworks. That's a uh, you know north-facing uh, classroom with glass uh, coming in. You just notice the slab, uh, the the roof. It's all girders, MS girders. We bought girders at twenty-seven thousand rupees a kg, and now it's uh, sixty thousand rupees a kg. So the kind of steel, amount of steel that has gone into the building has paid back for the construction cost of the entire campus. If we sell the steel today. Diffuse lights uh, from all over, shaded corridors, computer room. And that's a computer lab. North light. Uh, these are parrot brackets, which are very popular uh, in the traditional Bora community here. And uh, so we have used Tota bracket, it's called parrot brackets. And you can see the playing marbles being used as sandwich uh, uh, between two glass uh, for the door. And each section is colored blue, yellow, red, green. So chemical engineering is maybe blue and electrical is maybe green so that you identify in the entire vocabulary, you are able to place make yourself and you can identify this is your department. Um, yeah. Uh, this, this is, is another the building, new building in the, the polytechnic. Yeah, it's, it's uh, behind the main engineering block. And, and that you see, you notice, uh, no, no, just, just go back. This go is back the interesting it? thing, the uh, interesting uh, arrangement that has been done. The left hand side is the left hand side is the northern side. So you'll see the building is uh, lower on that side, and building keeps rising higher as it goes to the southern side to protect from the south southern heat and also get the north light. So you'll see all the north light is coming inside the building uh, from the north side, which is very important to take natural light. So the built form is arranged in such a manner that it gradually keeps rising up. The mass keeps rising up so that north light is not obstructed into the main areas of the building. Um, I think we are moving out from the JD ca campus and uh, these are other buildings. Uh, we have a stereotypical idea of how buildings should be uh, depending upon the function of the building. And if I were to ask you to uh, guess the, the function ins inside this building, then uh, I'm not sure uh, it's going to be so easy. Uh, let me tell you, because it's not an interactive session, that this is an IT building. This is this was made for an IT corporation that came into Nagpur. Uh, but whichever be the building, uh, we have to be comfortable, and uh, um, that that's important. Whether you are working in IT, where you have the air conditioners working uh, twenty four seven, or you are in any other uh, any other typology of building. So this is something that we uh, borrowed from Lori Becker of your own state. And you must all be acquainted any, with any, his work. Yeah. Another important aspect of this building, interesting aspect of this building, is that there's a baffle wall. There are two walls. The actual core of the building is inside, which is five feet yes. inside, 1.5 meter inside. So all these services are, uh, you know, running uh, air conditioning, cables, Cat6 cables, telephone, internet. Everything is running within that cavity uh, that is created by this baffle wall. This wall is outside, and the client wanted a, as usual, a typical. Uh, uh, glass sleek looking building and we tried to convince ultimately budget came to our rescue because that was costing 78 lakhs while this costed us 26 lakhs so the client ran out of money and this is what we did and it's heavily inspired like Sundar said from Laurie Baker's uh, architecture where we gave these uh, jallies brick jallies which not only takes care of the glare see what happens when you make a building which is there on the left hand side if you will see it is bringing in the glare while the function that is happening inside is an it and a computer screen oriented function so you need to cut the glare out so you give expensive blinds and expensive roll up blinds to you know cut the glare out so you're creating a problem and then you're trying to give a solution by providing those uh, uh,
expensive blinds. And also it brings a lot of heat. Even if you use heat reflective glass, it brings a lot of heat. And that uh, that increases the air conditioning load. In this, the, the this 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 outer skin was made two years after the building was completed, and the air conditioning load was about 200 and 225 tons was installed. But after the brick was uh, brick facade was complete, we now operate only on 125 tons of air conditioning load. So that is the kind of difference, you know, which happens with intelligent, sensitive, and a little uh, logical uh, application of mind in your projects. But we don't learn um, from our mistakes. Let me tell mistakes. you, despite, uh, yeah, despite the building that is standing there, it is standing in the IT park that we have at Nagpur. Uh, you see the new buildings that are coming up around it because uh, this is how we are conditioned to think. We always think that it is, it is glass, next. which is equal to IT. And so uh, this is the way it, it is going. You can see the next slide. Yes. Uh, see, these are we buildings. We keep continuing the mistakes. Made. We don't learn from our mistakes. We continue with our mistakes. We are doing the same thing with our architecture, with our cities and everything. Uh, so monstrous glass blocks are coming in place and we are still not able to think rationally. This is a project that we did for, uh, uh, for uh, a steel authority. And they wanted a glass building with steel and high tech looking building. And the temperature was about 48 degrees where it was being built. We said it is not logical, but we wanted the project. So we gave them a glass box in, in steel with a large overhang to avoid uh, direct sunlight. Glass is a wonderful material to use if you want to use it, but it has to be protected from direct heat. And then we gave these brick baffle walls and the building sits in a, a water body to mitigate the dryness of the heat to provide some little moist and humidity in the whole context and the baffle walls depending on whether it is west or south or whatever so that it creates a, a flow of air it cools down the air the water body cools down the air and it cuts the direct layer so you know you can use your uh, concepts and thought processes to mitigate a problem that comes either through the client or through the climate or the area where you're building. Shall uh, I move ahead a, with the projects? <laughs> yeah, I just uh, go quickly because uh, we'll just tell you there's a, there's a competition that we participated for School of Planning and Architecture Bhopal, which we obviously did not win because the jury thought that this was not the vocabulary for futuristic architectural expression. Uh, next, please. This, this, is, this is how the north light was taken into studios. These are the five studios that you had with a lot of meandering pathways and courtyards for interaction, discussions, you know, uh, traditional built form. A girl's hostel would have looked like this. This is a project that we're doing for a Banjara Community Museum for Gypsies. It's a huge project uh, where uh, you know, and the client wanted, they have a Nagada drum to beat. That is their symbol of their community. So the client wanted a, a drum like that structure. So we tried to convince him not to make a typical drum. And then we tried to derive an architectural form out of that concept of his. It's a 100% sustainable project. Uh, the entire uh, two megawatt of uh, solar is being installed here. The entire air condition is the largest museum in our country at the moment with about 1,25,000 uh, square feet of built up space. It's a very narrative experience, narrative uh, museum, digitized museum coming up. Uh, and everything is sustainable here. Another, uh, we do a lot of, uh, ironically, a lot of uh, temple redevelopment projects. Uh, this is another temple redevelopment project on the, uh, that was also a temple redevelopment project that you saw. This is also a temple redevelopment project. Uh, tourism, integrated tourism development project. Next. Uh, there's a guest houses, shopping complexes, interactive spaces wherein, you know, the villagers can come sit in the chopal and, you know, talk to each other, spend time while there's a guest house inside. Next, please. Right. So we are, we've changed the project now. This is, this is the resort and uh, believe it, this is uh, of the Taj group of hotels. And when they came into the wildlife sector, then this is a, a wildlife uh, resort that you have that we have very close to Nagpur, and this is at Bandhavgarh. We'd like to tell the interesting yeah. story about uh, the, the, the idea is the client wanted the client wanted to have a village replicated because uh, uh, that's what an urban urban dweller would like to you know escape from the drudgery of the urban life and the monotony of the urban life and go and live like a uh, like a uh, villager. 
so we have tried to be as authentic as possible there are a lot of interesting stories but we'll run out of time this was one of the most interesting projects that we did with <laughs> dean also involved in the whole process and uh, uh the first time i had to shut the shun the contractor out and throw the contractor out because he was making the walls in 90 degrees and in plum so we said we don't want that so we gathered the ladies of the villages who used to build houses traditionally there and the the entire resort was built by the ladies of the villages around uh, hand plastered and you know we have all swimming pools and you pay at that time when it was inaugurated about 70000 rupees a night to escape from the treasury of your you know you that's the paradox that we all live in wherein you keep uh, running around uh, earning money and then you want to buy a piece with that money that you want so that's the paradox that we all are living in and uh, that's the entrance where you arrive this is a coffee shop uh, there's, a, there's a I, I small courtyard outside where you can sit relax in the jungle and a very interesting part is this is in a bamboo forest bamboo cluster bandavar tiger sanctuary and we have not cut a or dislocated a single bamboo cluster or a clump and uh, we redid the plan so there are 12 cottages in the lodge and all the 12 cottages were realigned uh, when the layout was being done this is the lounge where you sit and watch and i don't know if you guys know about mahua tree mahua is a local fruit and a local tree and it is so contextual and so uh, organic to the region that every part of that tree is utilized by the villagers by the twigs they they make make flour and they make rotis the fruit is eaten by the is, is a very therapeutic uh, fruit and you make wine out of the fruit as well the local toddy is made out of that fruit everything of that is used by the so this is how it sits into the whole thing and we always talk of architecture being a non verbal communication and this we realized very eff effectively just go back i'll just relate the experience and uh Uh, what do you want to go do? Back. Yeah. Go back. Go back. So, ah, uh, this one. See those the the pattern around the windows. Pattern around the windows that you were saying. Uh, we liked it because it was there in one of the no, not this. We liked not it very much because it was you know there in almost all the houses uh, and windows. You're going That's back. Fine. This Anything is fine. Anything is fine. Yeah. So uh, we said, uh, uh, fine. Let's let's copy this uh, you know ornamentation around the openings and let's use it because it'll be more authentic. but the ladies were giggling and refusing to do that then we realized in their language we couldn't understand what the language was so the supervisor told us that when you have this pattern that you're seeing around the around the doors of the openings it communicates to the in, in the village community that there is a marriageable daughter in the house so that's architecture being used for non verbal communication so when the arrow is pointing up ironically it is the daughters and when the arrows are pointing down it is uh, birth of a boy uh, so a marriageable boy in the in the in the house so you know that's how architecture and architectural motif is used for non verbal communication in a society so the owner of the house need not go and tell everyone that you know his his daughter is marriageable now or is willing to marry you see this so uh, just by using a motif ornamentation in architecture it is clear that you know there is there is a so that's a language understood vernacularly by by the community there is also another resort of the same group uh, wherein you arrive at a nothing arrive at a courtyard that's the arrival you know contrary to what you arrive in a hotel with a an atrium and a lobby you arrive into nothingness and that's what you are basically going there to relax and you know do nothing and the pots on the right side are basically lighting fixtures you can sleep in the open in a machan wherein uh, only the mosquito nets prevent you to give you various kind of experiences this is a it's a very long the even the the lounge is an open lounge with no walls just a roof and maybe uh, since you are all from kerala you can uh, you can see something very familiar out there hanging there from the roof yeah the the boats the yes. boats Next. Shanti Day is yes. give me peace. Is what you are basically coming here for? You know, I was just discussing the paradox that we all live in. So this is this is a toilet block, uh, toilet block extension in metal and wood and stone uh, plinth, and it's all open glass. If you are not ashamed, you can shower in the uh, within the glass framework. We have given a lot of open. We introduced the con concept of open shower into a courtyard. so you know you to be as romantic as you can uh, and so unless you there is romance in the whole whole uh, designing process uh, you cannot uh, you know unless you love yourself you cannot love someone else so that's the concept of you know making and being involved in the whole process of design and 
each and every detail has to be looked into. This is a yoga hall in another resort that we've done. Reception of another resort. No walls, no windows. And this is a very interesting project of contemporary vernacular wherein you will notice, I don't know those of you who know what a space frame is. The space frame structure is supporting a Mangalore tiled, uh, terracotta tiled roof. And it's about a 4,000 square feet of uh, built space on eight columns on the periphery, no central columns. So you'll see those uh, typical uh, space frame structural system supporting a traditional building material. The reception sitting in the water body, paved in sh walkway, shaded walkways. That's how, you know, bamboo gives you that light patterns when you walk into the corridors. The another uh, resort nestled into the river bank, uh, Maua one, mud plastered walls and dining area without windows, it's all open. Just you need a shade over your head to protect you from the sun and rain. That's it. And that's you closer to na nature. Same dining from a different angle, different bedrooms, recycled windows, recycled wood, refurbished. Everything is refurbished here as well. Sandstone, we can go quickly now, so we're running out of time. Yeah, I, I will just move ahead. Is a residence in Sandstone. Mm -hmm. It's okay. done in a very different style because that's what the client insisted. So sometimes, yes, there are client insistences and uh, something that they love, but they love the idea of using sandstone in its... Uh, in so its this is a very interesting record. point that you're saying. I mean, see, this, this becomes, I see, colonial architecture, the British architecture that was there in, in and around Nagpur is also our heritage. So uh, it's also our vernacular now. That's also a part of our legacy of architectural inheritance that we have had. So even if we build like this, it's perfectly all right because that's also your heritage and your culture. Your heritage does not mean that you go back to Vedic times or you know how the uh, earlier builders built or how the Mughals built. But everything that has happened in the chain of evolution is your inheritance. Use of water bodies is very important to mitigate the dryness of the heat that we all have here. That changes the microclimate of the whole thing. Very interesting project. Another, there's also a resort, uh, very high-end resort, which unfortunately could not be built. Uh, 90,000 to 1 lakh rupee a night per couple was the... And it's a very interesting design, if you will see. Meandering, brick paved pathways. And then you have uh, a cottage, which is 1,000 square feet with an independent swimming pool and things like that, and courtyards and machans and everything to sleep, enjoy, whatever. Anyway, this is built, but not operational yet. Structural system is very important to work out. Like we told you, reintroduction of structural system. Very, very close to our heart house, which was built earlier. All, everything is recycled here. Everything is recycled except pots and pans and tapestry. Things. The it's staircase, really the, the wooden time. floor, from the textile mills, everything. These are all solar, you know, this is also a very interesting project. This is a wayside amenities on highways, National Highway Authority of India. We've given a proposal and we, it has been accepted. The, the entire bridge module that you see is, is, is a solar module. So it not only generates uh, electricity for the entire facility, but also provides electricity to the rural areas. And as you go down next, please. As you drive down, there are panels which will generate electric electricity as well. So not only it provides electricity to the uh, to the facility, but it also providing ele extra excess electricity instead of giving going back to the grid. We are giving it to the villages or villages around. Next. Please. The wayside amenities, you know, all solar paneled uh, roofs, generating electricity, sitting, relaxing, eating, toilet facilities, other facilities besides fueling stations. <clears throat> so, so we're just trying to sum about? up now. Yeah, we're just trying to sum up now in terms of context. That well, you, we saw have, uh, process, you saw the thought process. Uh, you saw the yes. thought process, you saw the method to convert it, and then you saw the result and the output of, of this entire process. Now, what is the learning that you carry? Uh, Smita will tell you, what are the learnings that you, you carry from this whole process? Um, yeah, I just move across the slides because I've uh, 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 these have really been labeled out very well. 
So uh, we're talking of context where we're talking of the nature culture relationship. So you will now be able to relate to what has, uh, we've run through all the projects. And uh, this is how the response to context is coming out in terms of the design output. This is the JD college as we are seeing and various different spaces. Uh, very important to say is that this has a distinct character and I think it's very important if in an educational institution, you grew up in a place that has a distinct character and a character which carries the feeling of nostalgia with it, because that's what you carry along for the rest of your life. You know, this is very important. I think something which has been lost with the international style and uh, where we do not really uh, connect to the land, connect to the context or to the people. massing and surroundings uh, also what is the massing the around you what are the surroundings you know what is the interplay of light and shadow you know all these are very important aspects when you when you work with context context doesn't mean ki agar yahan there's a building like this so we make a building like that context means so many things and these are the things that she's trying to uh, enlist light and shadow is such an important thing of architecture like like arbuzier said that architecture is actually a magnificent uh, composition of volumes that come under the light. So actually is a light that uh, is the first ornament that a building gets. See what light can do. Uh, this is a, a shadow of the fascia patti that you have, you know, the fascia that you have uh, at the end of the sloping roof. And this board. is in our house, uh, the eaves board. And here in the morning, you have this wonderful design that uh, comes out as a shadow because it's been designed so that the shadow comes out uh, very amazingly on the wall. This is getting the not light in the, the studios. Students, yes. the students these days say that, you know, uh, when you ask in a jury, what is your concept? So they say we are trying to use natural, we have used natural light and ventilation. That's not a concept. That's a <laughs> fundamental of architecture. You know, so, and, and that romance that needs to be created in every space that you design. You, you have to, I mean, if you see when you go to an ancient building, a traditional building, you feel at ease, you feel at peace, you feel very good, you feel calm, quiet. Why do you do that? Because of the kind of involvement of the architect and the builders that was there. Each and every detail was worked out. Each and every thing was thought out. You know, and that is the use of light and shade as well. And, and the, you can feel the romance that the person has done with so much of involvement in the building as if that person fell in love with what he was doing. He's talking of romance and he's talking of being involved. And I have a little story to tell you over here really quickly. That you see this wall here made of various different bits of uh, color tiles. Uh, this is our tiling uh, contractor who is so much in love with the projects and he knows what happens with his skill being a part of uh, the building environment. So he goes ahead and makes this wall. And then uh, we think it is overtly colored, but it's just a matter of how involved he was in coming forward with what he thinks is an amazing creation. So this is how even the tradesmen, the craftsmen, even the and, client, uh, various skills, even the clients. Yes, in this client case, is even so the client. involved in the process of building that when this courtyard was being built, let us say, he used to stand here and say, "Sir, we'll mm -hmm. sit here and see the tree, so we'll keep a bench here." You know, that is the kind of involvement. You know, each and every space in a huge campus, he even he was involved so much with the building process, and that romance and that love is seen, you know, in the in the output of the the spaces that we design. This again, Priyadarshini Institute. This is the Priyadarshini uh, School, yes. See the light and shadows. You know, the, the, the interplay of light and shadow is very important for any space to be worked out well. Next. Endless vistas, indulgence. You know, your visitor should indulge in your spaces, in your design. When you walk, you make him awake. When you're walking down a corridor, he should be in, interested in seeing you know, what is beyond that corridor. Create that kind of interest where that is indulgence. Your viewers and your users have to be indulge, you know, indulgent in your spaces that you design. They should be excited at every step. They should wonder whether they should look right, left, ahead, you know, and then you should be inclined to go ahead and walk and see what is at the corner. Light is also uh, an artist and you can use it as a canvas uh, in your projects, in your spaces whether it is artificial or natural. Create a exhilaration at unexpected places, the partitions in urinals, you know, a very mundane but a natural activity can also create some interest by your designs. The temperature of a space is very important, the warmth of a space, the coldness of a space, 
you know, is very important. You have to learn all these things, and that's what our traditional architecture actually teaches us. The contrast, romance of the wall and sunlight. You know, the interaction with the sun and its moods. Louis Kahn said, "Sun never knew its importance unless the light hit a wall." So, uh, you know, sun, morning sun is different, afternoon sun is different, evening setting sun is different. You have to exploit the sun in all its glory, and that gives the moods that you have in your buildings, in your spaces. Similarly, uh, walls and the interplay of light and shadow with the sun is a very integral, should become a very integral part of your designs. You have to create a stage for the sun to play. It is a, such a wonderful uh, natural element. Create a stage for it to play. The warmth of materials, the tactile nature, the texture of materials. Yes. The uh, materials are living beings. Consider materials as living beings. You know, you are living being. You have a relationship with the, you have a you have a relationship with a particular person. You gel with a particular person better than you gel with another person. Similarly, materials also have relationships with each other. They have their temperature, they have their warmth, they have their interaction. You have to learn what is the, you know, the, look at the relationship between two materials. How does stone talks to brick? How brick talks to plant? How uh, plants or how, you know, plants talk to the earth or to the sky? You need to understand the relationship of these materials as everything that goes into your building, consider it as a living material, living being. And then you will understand the importance, whether, you know, uh, whether you are friends with stone or whether brick is a friend with stone or no. So that is something that we need to uh, learn and be sensitive to understand in our designs. Next. Solids and voids can be, you know, exploited to your advantage. Unfolding excitement. I mean, look at the roofs which start from the grounds and you don't, from the ground and you don't know what is starting where, what is ending where. And that's a sense of mystery, a sense of uh, exhilaration that you can create in your projects. User yeah, interface. This is an amazing space. It's a user interface. The space created um, an area where the students uh, could engage and you know contribute to what was already standing there. That's that's how it is. It becomes a user interface because it encourages the user to become a part of it. So and you ask, it, you welcome them on. Why don't you add to it? And then it it gives a sense of belonging. You know, a particular group of students would have worked on this art uh, mural, uh, you know, and sometime. And that is a belongingness that a person has, that user gets bonded to the space that you've designed, to the building that you've designed. It will always be etched in his memory that he contributed in the process of, you know, building this space or building this building. Wait, I think... Um, emotional I think response, unless, uh, unless your oh. spaces and buildings evoke emotional response in your user, you have failed as a designer. So that emotional uh, response whether it is good or bad, you may hate a building when you go. You know, I, I hate a particular architect's building, you know, he or she, but, but it evokes a response, it evokes an emotion in me. And that evoking of that emotion is very important. And then you become a good, successful architect. Um, I think we have come to an, a conclusion. Next, next, please. Next, just press the button. See, our architecture is, this is fundamental of our thought process and architecture is based on the fundamental philosophy that in the eternal journey of my soul, I am a visitor on this earth. And I have inherited, apart from many things, architecture. And that when I leave this earth, nothing of me will remain. My body will merge with nature. My architecture, whenever it dies, shall do so too. That to me is real sustainability, absolute truth, and the foundation of true architecture in the world, which basically means that you use materials in such a manner that just like my body will be gone with the earth, merged with earth, you create materials, you use materials in your body whenever your building dies, hypothetically, metaphorically, the materials that you use shall be consumed by Mother Earth. And that is the fundamental of all sustainable architecture in the world. There is nothing else. There is no 
green environment friendly whatever high flying terms you would want to use high flying rating systems that you would want to use it is all useless crap this is the fundamental of being sustainable to a large extent to a greater extent than anything else and that is the fundamental lying thought process of our architecture of our thought process this is the summary of our thought process and this needs changing of mindsets next please this is changing of mindsets and unless that happens unless we change our minds we will not be able to achieve this so thank you so much for listening to us so patiently Uh, thank, you, sir, thank you ma'am thank you sir thank Habib you sir, so much for the patient listening it, it has been a wonderful presentation i would say that it has been an architectural delight for all of us and it was just like listening like reading a retrovian book of 10 books of architecture listening to 10 commandments of architecture and the profound way in which you have uh, given uh, in, invention intervention uh, to make internal internationalism uh, to make it very much regionally modern is remarkable very remarkable i opener i would say that it is really a redefining moment uh, your practice spread over three or four decades it's marvelous and definitely it conveys a sense of continuity uh, it obviously has a very meaningful contextual linkage so in all ways and all manner i believe your sessions and your architecture is very meaningful and definitely it will remain intact and the identity will prevail beyond times thank you ms mudha ma'am and thank you habib sir thank you thank you so much for having thank us here so if there are any questions yeah uh, we would like to take the questions yeah. akil i would want to thank uh, mr mohammad kuti for being here for the entire <laughs> presentation for an hour <laughs> an honor <laughs> thank you thank you very much sir actually i i should thank you because you are this sunday you take time to us because we are <laughs> trying to such a people like you together come here for our uh, for our decision and we re- invite you after this pandemic you both yes. of you our our uh, kerala isala and mr ashish will take care about this yes sir absolutely our pleasure thank you sir thank any you. questions someone want to ask students or something if they want to interact uh, akil we could open up the forum first queries yeah. yes <laughs> yeah yeah uh, now it's the question and answer session Uh, it's open for the audience to ask questions hello 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 sir hello ma'am first of all uh, thank you very much for talking to us and enlightening us and actually i am a very keen follower of both of you and i have actually uh, watched a lot of talks in youtube and that genda full concept wala of presentation that was the one one presentation which i like the most and there was one single question which was dangling in my mind right there uh, that is uh, now you have shown us the concept of contemporary vernacular architecture so here you clearly made us understand that how to pick up the key elements of the past and incorporate it into the modern world uh, but sir when we uh, now look around the world uh, we are now very much moving towards generic design and parametrism like Uh, we are very much inspired by it, but at the same time we are also blinded by it because we are seeing this coin-shaped building and wing-shaped building and all. So now, uh, just like how you have uh, incorporated vernacular and contemporary, uh, what's your view on incorporating vernacular architecture into this generic and parametric kind of design? For example, like uh, 3D printed uh, clay building supported with genetically modified trees and all. Oh, you answer or should I? Yes, I would like to know. You answer. He has a, he has a question for you. He's been hearing you since the Genda Pool days. <laughs> no, we we <laughs> deliberately avoided the Genda Pool thing because we thought we are speaking in Kerala, so probably you will not understand the Hindi and the context. So we avoided the Genda Pool thing. Uh, it's nice that you've been listening to all this and uh, see the there's a fundamental uh, flaw in the question that you have asked. I'm not saying you are wrong. it's a very intelligent question coming from a student a uh, fundamental flaw in the terms of generic design and we were talking against generic design it is not generic design cannot be generic design has to be specific has to respond to a context parametricism 
genetically modified trees are a byproduct of a thought process. They are not the thought process by themselves. So, uh, uh, if you want to, uh, if you want me to answer it lightheartedly, we are going towards our doom <laughs> when we are trying to. So you will modify genetically a human being, which we already started doing that. Uh, you modify trees genetically for what? I mean, the trees are so beautiful, so complete, uh, you know, living things in themselves. If there are no trees, you are not there. You will, you are dead because they, no one will be able to process carbon dioxide that you exhale. So why do you want to genetically modify? I mean, that's a fundamental question that uh, all human beings need to think. Uh, but when it comes to parametricism, you're talking of, you know, the architecture of Zahadid or Kalatrava or whatever X, Y, Z. Uh, there's nothing wrong in building. Let us understand in which context it is being built. You know, parametricism or the kind of architecture and what are what are the economics involved in the, in the whole thing? What are the materials involved in the whole thing? What is the structural system involved in the whole thing? Can our country afford it? Can, can our country go for it? Is it is it sensible enough to make that kind of architecture in our country? Is what we need to think, and when we will be able to uh, be overdeveloped, when our GDP will be thousands and thousands of dollars, we will be able to afford it. Now you see Frank Gehry's Bilbao Museum or any other building; it's all titanium clad. You bloody can't afford to use uh, one hundred the cost of material which is costing as titanium, and there you're using titanium building material as your cladding and as your roofing. Uh, so these things have to be understood uh, by, by us. Uh, today, we are unable to even clad our buildings with the cladding material of ceramic that was, uh, you know, produced by John Hudson when the Sydney Opera House was made. Sometimes, you know, I don't know how many years ago. Uh, we are still unable to produce that in our factories, in our country. Uh, so is it logical to use something which the developed so-called economically self-sufficient world, whether we are in a position to use it today is, is, is a question that we need to fundamentally answer within our own selves. And then we can go. It's all glamorous to see parametricism and, you know, to see those high flying material and spaces and techniques. It's, it's very good to look at Kalatrava's designs. It's very, the students get enamored by Zahadid and Kalatrava and Gary and so on and all. But when it comes to a Smita or a Habib Khan or a DD Cruz or you know someone else from our country, we are all peanuts because you don't uh, uh, are enamored by the kind of thought process that we all have because this is not glamorous. What we are running is a marathon. What they are running is a 100 meter dash. You will know who is the fastest man on earth, but you will never know who is the marathon winner in Olympics. Can you name? But you will know Usain Bolt or anyone else, you know, the fastest man on earth, because that's a short-lived, glamorous, glamorous thought process, which will not sustain your country. I think I, what uh, the students spoke just now just took us back to the time when we were ourselves very young and just about in practice. And I, like I told you, yes, that was the construction. And that's how you realize that the, these things are uh, very short-lived. Somehow we have to there respond to the in fact architecture. that... Yes, uh, thank you, sir. You again opened my eyes, so thank you very much. Yes, I mean, see, to get swayed by glamour is, is all good. You know, there are, you have to understand the fine line dividing fashion and style. You know, there's, there's a, I mean, there, were, there was a time when we used to wear those uh, bell bottoms, sometimes it was drain pipes, you know, now we have shorter length uh, trousers. So these are all fashions in architecture. But the fundamental premise and the thought process is what exists within your soul. You know, when you wear a tie, it was a broader tie, then the ties became narrow, and, and the style of the coats change. Everything keeps changing. These are styles, you know, which you have to understand. But the fundamental premise, which is the soul inside, which you, if you would have seen that uh, explanation of the Genda Pool song, that is more important to us, and that is what we are talking of. Yes, sir, very much right. Any other queries? Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for being part of the program. And it uh, actually enlightened me uh, very much. 
uh, what i want to ask was uh, i was inspired by your contemporary vernacular thought process so what i want to ask was is there so, any limitations uh, what i want to ask was is, is there the... any limitations to the process like uh, we are living going to be uh, a space needy community to, towards the future so we must be building a, a lot of high rise buildings so in the in that sense there could be uh, so much more uh, limitations to the contemporary vernacular design so what are your thoughts on that as an experienced person there is no limitation there is no limitation in the thought process is we have shown you a kind of projects that we are interested in that we do and that we get mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, it's a thought it's a thought process wherein we are not saying you do not you should not make high rise buildings or you should not use glass or you should not use concrete we are not saying that what we are saying is uh, if you learn from the learnings of the past or the vernacular you have to understand the wisdom behind it and you have to understand the process behind it and if that process you can fit in a high rise building there is nothing wrong in that there is another thought process which is also very important is why do we need a high rise building does mm -hmm. it does it does it sound logical to you there is another thought process i'm i'm not trying to say that do not make make high rise building we are talking of shortage of space in cities we are talking of shortage of uh, so many other infrastructure facilities so when you give a high rise building which is say 20 floor 40 floor high you are trying to solve the city city's problem of space and city's problem of housing but the fundamental premise is who has defined these boundaries and who has defined the cost and who has defined what should a city look like why do we need a high rise building why can we not have optimally uh, worked out cities where a city can live Uh, you know quality of life we discussed man is always rooted to earth that he is you know uh, brought in from and will go back to from so when you make a person stay on the 22nd floor of a building or 48th floor of a building devoid of the contact with mother earth what kind of quality of life is that man leading or why do we need this shall, shall we not strive to change the whole concept of development whole concept of infrastructure development Can we not empower our rural economy and our uh, agricultural sector so that people do not migrate towards cities and pressurize the existing infrastructure of the cities? When you need to make uh, bigger and bigger cities, we have traffic issues, we have transportation issues, and we have infrastructural issues. Shall we not address these fundamental problems? And we, as students of architecture, we as architects, are the right people to address this issue. Wherein we say the city is optimal. and the quality of life of my citizens in my city is good is is livable you know we are creating air quality indexes which are running into hundreds wherein if you go abroad and see the western world it is not even 1 and 2 when it goes to 2 they they leave the city and go to uh, countryside and we are living daily today is 396 while my my city is 78 you know so what kind of quality of life we are having so let us fundamentally address this issue but answering your question traditional wisdom traditional knowledge of vernacular and the process of vernacular can be understood to apply in a high rise building or any other building as well you saw a campus which was large campus 40 acres 5 lakh square feet it was applied there where you probably never thought ki an engineering college campus could look like this and so on and on so a vertical building also can be uh, not only looking like that but using the principles of the process of vernacular architecture okay um good morning sir good morning ma'am my okay. question is to you ma'am have you ever fa faced difficulties as a female architect because as a fe uh, as a female architecture student i feel so uh, so many difficulties so can you also give some um, some inspiration you are also an inspiration to us and can you just uh, give us a few a uh, few thoughts about uh, being um, a leading female architect like you um uh, thanks uh, but i'm i'm really not leading nor do i want to lead uh, we have these uh, very skewed up notions about who leads or who is famous or why should you be famous and why should you be a star architect and if you are a star architect only then you know your life has to move towards becoming a star architect you know because of these notions that we all uh, kind of are conditioned in that makes life more miserable so 
uh, let's first understand there are difficulties and uh, maybe as girls yes we face them a little more uh, but it's also because we all try to align ourselves to a certain definition that has somehow being accepted in the world uh, more than talking about me as a woman let me just uh, dwell a little bit on why in the field of architecture we only say that if you're an architect who makes a building then you're an architect if you don't make a building then you're not an architect it's not like that uh, what i'm trying to say is in a field like architecture it's a mother field it's it's a mother uh, course for five long years you've not studied only making buildings and you have studied so many other things they've been part of art that you studied a part of technology a little bit of computer uh, a lot of social science haven't you been uh, educated in so many aspects so it's like a mother field and uh, i'll come to this point of being a woman slightly later because i understand this is a problem many girls and many women are facing and uh, uh, i'll just come to that so you know why we think that at the end of 5 years everybody the men the women the boys the girls they all have to get into practice and they all have to practice making buildings now it is little difficult for every person who graduates to start making buildings but there are so many lateral fields that are adding to this mother field that are enriching the mother field can we talk about a few of them see there are architects men and women boys and girls who've gone into journalism they've gone into photography they've gone into interior designing there are plenty of people who do landscaping uh, there are plenty of people who've gone into entertainment so you see the field is quite wide so if you think that there is a difficulty because i think most of this difficulty stems from the fact that we always align with this one singular thought architect make a building if you don't make a building you're not a successful architect so you see half the problems of most of the women arise because it's very difficult to stand in the world in a practice all by yourself and currently it is extremely male dominated i would agree with that it does need a bit of hand holding a yes, bit of support sir. yes that's probably yes. what you are uh, so there are many fields open to you making buildings is one of them so i think that's uh, that's how it is and uh, you know at this end we have a women's committee now in the coa and we are learning now to look at the whole gender issue in architecture so yes as a part of it we would be reaching out to all the women architects and the women uh, the girl students too thank you ma'am i will, I will also so add in i will also add in a little being the only man in the house with two daughters <laughs> okay, and my sir. wife uh, and working almost all my life with uh, women associates uh, and in my college where more than 60% are uh, girl students uh, yes there is a bias and uh, i have noticed on when i go on site and when uh, smita used to go or you know daughters used to go or my associates used to go there is a kind of a defiance in the contractors uh, mind and if the instruction is coming from a woman they do not accept it they will cross check mm -hmm. either with me or with a with a with a man architect so called so uh, there is a, there is a difference and this is more so unfortunately in the northern part of our country and as you come down it it mellows down a little i don't know what the situation is in kerala but but there is a gender bias definitely in the construction industry it it's not so much in in terms of client in terms of corporate sector or corporate houses but uh, yet i have seen in corporate meetings uh, wherein uh, women architect is doing a presentation and uh, the the ceos or the owners have no confidence on that women architect there is a bias and it is time that we men change our point of view change our point of view and uh, and look at uh, uh, women as equal contributors to our profession not only our profession but but in in building of our nation and that needs to change we need to change uh, i always say that i mean pardon me is saying this in in your institute but uh, all those ladies who wear burqas and you know hijabs and all i say they need not do that it is our it is men who need to put you know a veil on our eyes we have to improve our Uh, our viewpoint not them so uh, it is the same with architecture and keeping that in mind we have uh, uh, like smita just said she is a part of that women's committee we are addressing lot of issues gender gender disparity 
issues in architecture and hope we'll succeed very shortly sure sir thank you sir thank you ma'am and before we end as if i'll do my job being the president <laughs> of the council definitely sir <laughs> to all <laughs> to all the students uh, i am sure some of you might be knowing what council of architecture is and uh, what it does uh, but if you don't know council of architecture is constituted uh, under the architects act of 1972 architecture is fortunate enough to have a act a governing act which regulates profession and education so that you all get better quality of education and you all when you become architects your profession is also regulated and governed by a body which is the council of architecture so that's the role of the council of architecture and the fundamental efforts that we are missing, making uh, 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 with my team me as the president and my team is to restore the dignity of architects in this society and make society aware of what is the contribution of an architect and what is the contribution of architecture in nation building that is our fundamental promise i always say that doctors make a very tangible contribution to the country by looking after the health of a uh, of of the citizens and it's a very tangible contribution when you are ill when you are not well when you are not in a happy frame of mind you go to a doctor but architects contribute intangibly to the building of the nation and the quality of life and well being of your of our citizens because the quality of spaces that you design the kind of buildings that you design actually affect your life 24/7 if i make a bad space a mad bad building it will affect you indirectly and you will never come to know that the building or the space that i have designed is affecting you architects are actually uh, the well being are the are the custodians of the well being of our country's citizen and that is a very important role that architects play and it is our effort to the council of architecture to make this society aware of architectural uh, significance in their lives and also in nation building so this is what the council of architecture does and we are opening up uh, and we are we are have a very strong presence in the social media as well we are trying to reach to every uh, age group of our fraternity right from fresh grad students to fresh graduates to middle uh, level architect and to senior architects and and all uh, educate academics uh, like smita said there are so many avenues that you go into so whether it is academics or it is profession or anything related allied field we are trying to reach out and build a homogeneous fraternity which will be a strong voice maker in our country so that's the role of the council of architecture for those students who didn't know Uh, Smita, ma'am, Habib, sir, I once again like to read that your thoughts, your practice, your portfolio rightly depicts the meaningful defiance against the existing notions of architectural modernism, uh, against urbanism, and obviously our outlook of life as such. So I am very sure that today's short presentation would. Uh, go a long way in the minds of the listeners also we have uh, shared this presentation live so more than the audience we have right now i guess your voice your thoughts uh, both of your thoughts would definitely reach a long way i am sincerely thankful uh, for your kind words and i would like to again emphasize like just like listening to vitruvius 10 uh, books of architecture your practice uh, definitely imbibes a lot of meaning and i am sure in the coming days uh, it will make uh, just like uh, the session was started jahan ka wapas aayenge wo din i'm sure that you know with your approaches we definitely wapas aayenge wo din for acha thank you sir now I'd... thank you so much thank, thank you, you so, thank much. so much thank you so much thank you and uh, now i'd like to invite our head of the department mm-hmm. akrif divya denchen to formally give a vote of thanks morning mr sir morning ma'am It's great to have you here with us. Uh, very enlightening talk. I mean, uh, actually, the students need to actually uh, see the entire thing, uh, uh, like the co- in a comprehensive uh, way, like how uh, architecture is conceptualized and how it goes all the way to its execution. And we, when we talk, like uh, when we talk only about concepts, and by the end of the day, it never actually reflects in the design, actually. So, but the, the things that actually uh, uh my take away i would say it's like the first thing is that the title itself that vocal for local it actually uh, reflects when reflected more when you said that it's uh, as the first commandment of the 10 that you enlisted that is the empowering of the 
local masons to rejuvenate the local economy so that exactly is uh, what we need that is the need of the hour actually and it was very uh, interesting actually uh, i don't know uh, this must have been something that uh, most of uh, the people missed that is that uh, we actually lost uh, the connection from history there was a uh, that evolution the links of evolution that we kind of lost after the uh, industrialization so we need to actually reestablish and reinvent the lost links so as so as to actually have more meaning to the architecture that we are we are going to live from now on right so this must be some new and uh, uh, very rejuvenating kind of concepts that the children actually must have uh, got to know today uh, so and always they can always fall back to the very useful 10 commandments that you gave today so you uh, if ever if ever they are in doubt like okay what is this what should i do next okay they should go they can actually go back and check if they have already uh, they have actually missed something or if they are following something from this 10 commands and all it is very interesting and very informative talk uh, and i on on behalf of alislam institute of architecture i thank you both uh, smita ma'am and habib sir for being with us today and for giving such an informative talk and we look forward to having you at our campus once uh, all this uh, uh, covid uh, situation uh, you know goes down thank you so much for being online thank you. thank you thank you thank you to the refreshing change from all the come on, all the amendments and the policies and the rules and regulations <laughs> that i have been talking about thank you so much <laughs> thank you thank you sir thank, thank you chairman sir for also being with us thank you bye